The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. This is some work I did while I was on sabbatical last year at BAM in Berlin. It's their big government building research institute. And they had some interesting equipment that I was using because I wanted to look at what's the impact of curing on near surface drying and reabsorption of water after the fact into pavements. This was a pavement structure. And the tool we used was called an NMR mouse, nuclear magnetic resonance, which you may or may not be familiar with. But it's a technique that if you can, just like with a medical NMR, you use a magnetic field, you align the protons, which is hydrogen in the water molecules, and then you let the magnetic field go and the water relaxes. And you can actually quantify that to get the water content of concrete. And the different forms of water in concrete, whether it's liquid water or water that's held on surfaces or chemically combined water, will relax at different rates so you can separate them out. This device is a portable device. They can actually take it into the field and lay it on pavements and measure the near surface moisture profile in concrete pavements. So it's an interesting thing. It measures over a two inch by two inch cross section of the surface so you can average over reasonably sized aggregates. And it has a resolution of about a tenth of a millimeter. So in other words, you can profile it a tenth of a millimeter, although we did it at half a millimeter depths. That's what the device looks like. This is a concrete cube specimen sitting on this table. This device is mounted below here with this magnet and has a laptop. And you can see that the real-time moisture profiles in the concrete as we're testing it. And then this thing can be picked up and inverted and put over a concrete surface in the field, which is what they were doing with it at this research lab. And this is just what I was saying. I'm not an expert in nuclear magnetic resonance, but this relaxation time of water after you let the magnet go, if it's free water, it happens in a very short term time, which is this dotted line, chemically combined water, or water that's held on surfaces at a nano level, has a completely different time frame. So we can get rid of that stuff and just look at the free water in the pores, which is the liquid water in concrete. So we've made a concrete that is typical of what they use on mainline highways in Germany, because it was, this work was going on with the German Highway Department, which is they typically use a 0.45 water cement ratio, a type 1 Portland cement, 360 kgs, which I can't remember the conversion to, just over 3 quarter inch aggregate, air entrained, and strengths of about 43 megapascals, which is about 6,000 psi. And we measured the Coulomb values, and it was about 2,400, which is typical for a type 1 concrete and about that water cement ratio. We use three types of curing on this. We cast six inch cubes, which is that's what they use instead of cylinders in Germany for strength testing. We cast cubes, we covered them with glass plates and then at six hours I let the one face of the concrete try to dry out. In other words, it simulates just giving an initial finish and then letting water evaporate, which is essentially no curing. We then did four day water curing and then 11-day water curing, and you may wonder why I picked those oddball numbers. That's because it had to fit in around weekends. I'm working at a government research institute, and I had to work around weekends, and I could only cast on a certain day of the week, so I was living within the confines of the place and my access to it. So there's the top of a six-inch cube, and we marked out four areas because I, I was concerned about aggregate effects, so I did different areas. These are two-inch squares on that six-inch by six-inch surface, and we put that on the thing and measure the moisture profile underneath each one of those areas of the surface. And just to look at drying profiles, this is the three different curing regimes. This is moisture content, volumetric moisture content in that concrete versus depth below the surface. So there's a quarter inch, about half an inch there. We're going down to 15 millimeters, which is about five-eighths of an inch. Now, the device can go down further, but it starts to lose accuracy. So you can't go through a huge depth. But a lot of what we worry about is the curing in that upper zone uh, in terms of durability of surfaces. And what you see there, the blue line is when we didn't cure it at all. This is the moisture content of the concrete after 40 days of drying, a month and a half of drying at a 50% humidity lab condition. Basically, it's completely dry at the surface, and it's got only a couple of percent moisture, even down to 5 eighths of an inch. When we allowed four days curing, which is the red line, or 11 days, it didn't seem to make a huge difference. That extra moist curing kept that concrete moist beyond about one millimeter from the surface. So we've got about double the moisture content in that concrete. 
And if that's liquid water that's available to continue the hydration of the cement with time. So if you let the concrete dry out without curing, there's going to be no liquid water left near the surface to continue the hydration of the cement and densify that surface, make it more impermeable. But if we keep it even moist for a couple of days, it then retains that moisture and allows that hydration to continue well beyond the curing period. And I looked at the bottom face, I flipped it over, and this is so six inches below the surface and 40 days dry. What we see is there wasn't much difference. We saw a big difference on the cast face, which is what I showed you before, with drying, versus flipped over on the bottom face or formed face of the soffit of a bridge deck, for example. There wasn't a huge difference in that moisture content. So the big impact was on the finished surface, that drying profile, 40 days. And then we looked at rate of drying. So this is again the same sort of moisture content versus depth or water content versus depth. And what you see is after one day or 20 hours drying, almost one day, you essentially get a straight line relationship of drying versus depth from that surface. It's drying out more at the surface than it is in five eighths of an inch. And so that's one day, four days and six days, and then you're out three weeks, four weeks. The drying rate slows down. But you see that a lot of drying goes on, even in the first day, because if it had zero time of drying, it would have been up here, right across the top. So we had a lot of drying in the first day, and then continued drying with time. It's not unexpected, but it puts some quantitative numbers to the amount of moisture that's left in those pores to continue the curing of the concrete. Now, interestingly enough, we just took some wet concrete, fully saturated concrete, and we measured the moisture content at depth. You'll see this noise in there, which is probably due with variability of aggregate quantities with each profile we're testing. This is depth, sorry, I've got it in microns instead of millimeters here, so that's 16 millimeters. Same profile, but we did it three times. That's sort of reproducibility on the data we're getting. The other interesting thing on a, on a finished surface, you get higher moisture at the surface because you've got more paste at the surface. So therefore, you've got more porosity, therefore you're going to hold more moisture when it's wet. And that outer two to three, two to four millimeters, or about an eighth of an inch. So we've got less aggregate in that top eighth of an inch, so we're going to have more paste, therefore more moisture. So after we did some drying experiments, after the different curing regimes, we took cubes and did a one-phase absorption. We basically dropped them into a few millimeters of water. The sides were sealed, and we measured the water uptake into that back into there, which would simulate if you had salt water splashing in and being reabsorbed into that surface. We put the cubes back on after various time frames and measured that moisture profile to see how quickly that water went in into what depth. And so here's some data. This is with no wet cure. In other words, it wasn't cured at all. And what you see here is that this is the original condition, this dark line, before we put it in the absorption test. It's dry, tiny bit of moisture at depth because it wasn't fully dry that far down. But one minute absorption, we're down to about over a quarter inch here, going up after one minute of water to uptake. Four minutes is the green line. We start to see it going in deeper and more moisture. Then at some point, and this goes up to six hours here. You don't see much increase in moisture at the surface, but the moisture that is there starts to penetrate in further in depth with that surface. So this would sort of indicate how quickly, if you splash salt water on there, after one minute, the salt water has penetrated a quarter inch into that concrete. And after four minutes, it's penetrated about three-eighths of an inch. And after a couple of hours, it's penetrated about five-eighths of an inch into that surface. And we couldn't go any further. It's probably gone further. But we just couldn't measure that. If you give it four days wet curing, A, the original concrete wasn't as dry to begin with, um, so it's not going to absorb as fast. But again, you see the one minute, four minute, up to six hours here. And that, the reason it's sloping up here is because there's still moisture in the interior because it held moisture because it was cured longer. So we see an increase in moisture with four days curing, but the numbers are lower. And after 11 days curing, it's pretty similar as well. The four days difference between zero and four days wet curing was pretty significant less so between 4 and 11 days. If we kept it on longer, and this was after 20 hours, let the water soak in for 20 hours, we started to see moisture building up at depth where we didn't see it up to 6 hours. So we get further penetration of that water absorption. It's the same graph as before, but with an extra line on it. Normally, if you measure water absorption, or you plunk the face into water, you'd get a fairly linear relationship between with the square root of time, the linear rate of water uptake which is the rate of absorption. You get an initial rate, and then you get a secondary rate. There's an ASTM standard day of 1585 you can use to measure that. But this just shows the profiles we were getting with the different curing. That's when it was not cured. 
get a high rate of absorption and a very large amount of absorption. And with four days and 11 days, the one that's on top of the other here, they're essentially identical. Much lower absorption and a much lower rate of absorption. So that sort of ties into what you'd get with an ASTM 1585 test method. But we're doing this using the neutron magnetic resonance. So, effective drying. Saw this outside an Irish restaurant. <laughs> we dried the concrete to try and accelerate the drying because I was running out of time on my sabbatical. We used 40 degrees C or 100 Fahrenheit to try and accelerate the drying rate of concrete. And we did that on a cube that was wet cured for two weeks and measured that drying rate. Uh, sorry, we dried it for about a month and a half at 40 degrees. <coughs> and then until it got a fairly steady state of sort of mass in this cube. And then we measured the water uptake again from one minute, four minutes, up to six hours into that uptake. So you get a progressive ingress. It's sort of what you'd anticipate, but it was instead of sort of guessing at it, we could actually visualize this water content with depth using this technique. And then at later ages, up to 18 hours, you start to see this water content raising at a deeper depth without any increase over here because you've saturated the concrete near the surface, but that extra water is still being sucked in and saturating the concrete deeper in which is kind of an interesting phenomenon. You rapidly saturate that outer three-eighths of an inch, but then later on you start to saturate further in, even though nothing's changing up out at the surface. When we dried it 110 degrees, in other words, the boiling point, typical concrete, you dry the concrete 100 degrees, which is a big mistake, but we do it in a lot of different tests. You get a huge increase that's not representative of what happens under normal drying conditions. You get really rapid increase, again showing one minute, four minutes. This is huge depth going in because it damaged the concrete in the process of drying it. Which again is one of the dumb things about ASTM 642. The porosity test and the volume of permeable voids that people like to measure, which is none of the above. Because the first thing you do in that test is dry the concrete at 110 C and you crack the concrete. Then you let water go in and you boil it. Then you call it the volume of permeable voids. And the only thing that's permeable about is the fact that you cooked at 100 and cracked the concrete and let that water permeate which doesn't happen in real life. It's one of the dumbest tests on record, but a lot of people love it. The effect of drying on water absorption, how significant is the drying effect? And what we did is we measured the 16 minute absorption, just about 15 minutes. And what we saw is that if we looked at a 110 degree concrete, dries the, which one's 110 here? It's the red line. Whereas if we just did it at 40 degrees Celsius, we have the green line. If we just dry the concrete at room temperature at 50% humidity in a normal, unaccelerated way, we've got the blue line. So what we see is we get a different curve when you cook it in an oven before you do the drying, which is one of the reasons that C1585, the absorption test, doesn't use 110 degree drying. You don't want to crack the concrete. You're changing the concrete. You're trying to measure before you measure it. So if you do the normal, unaccelerated drying, you get a different curve of water uptake. So this technique, which they call the NMR mouse, which I thought was quite amusing because it weighs 36 kilograms. It's not exactly a mouse, but it is portable. You can provide moisture profiles accurately down to about 15 millimeters, although the manufacturer says 25, which is an inch. There is some noise probably because of the size of the coarse aggregate relative to the area you're measuring over. During absorption tests, the surface pores rapidly saturate, and then you start to see the buildup of moisture deeper in. Not surprising but it's interesting to see how that profile developed. Four days moist curing had a huge impact on slowing down the drying rate of fresh concrete and also reducing the absorption of water after the fact on mature concrete. So in other words, after it's in service, you'd have a much a slower uptake of water or salt water or other aggressive fluids if you provide that extra curing. Met curing beyond four days for this particular concrete had no impact on that drying rate or the absorption rate for that particular concrete. So there's an optimum time for curing that sort of maximizes the impact of that curing in terms of potential durability of that concrete. And of course, there's a bunch of other fun things we could have done. Look at alternative curing. We could look at curing compounds, different curing periods. If I'd had the time, we could have looked at blended cements. What happens if you have fly ash or slag concrete in terms of that rate of drying because that is a different pore structure. And there's a bunch of other things we could do if we had the time, but I didn't, although it was interesting bringing Berlin. But they do things differently in Germany. These are cores they removed from one of the Autobahns. They're six and a half feet diameter cores. They have a truck mounted unit that can do a full depth core in 20 minutes. It goes in, goes 
and they put two lift lugs in it, they pick it up, put it in a flatbed, they take it away, and then they just wait for a car to come in and fall in, I guess. <laughs> now, apparently they patch it, because the German Autobahn, I don't know if you notice the cracks in the joints here, about 10% of the German Autobahns have alkali silica reaction and they're prematurely deteriorating, which is why you can't go as fast as you want everywhere you want, because they've got traffic cones as they repair these, but they keep using straight Portland cement and not mitigating it, because the highway department doesn't believe in those things like fly ash and slag in their concrete, so they continue to make concrete that will continue to crack up due to alkali silica reaction, which is a sad comment on the industry in general, but it's just something different, so I threw that in. Thank you for your indulgence.